Is Intel back? That's definitely the question of the week as Intel launches their all new 6900P of Xeon CPUs. Today we're going to go over everything there is to know about this new processor, what it means for you, and more importantly, how it stacks up against the competition. All right, everyone, our customers have spoken. I'm hearing they're no longer satisfied with normal intelligence. So instead, we need to jump right onto the next big thing, and that, of course, is... Uh, artificial intelligence? What? No, everyone uses AI. We need something bigger, something better. We need to jump straight to... Ludicrous intelligence. What if we just used actual intelligence and went with Vulture? We can run our services in the cloud. They've got options for virtualized or bare metal instances, even HPC or GPU compute for AI accelerated workloads. What about storage? Yep, SSD backed object and block storage plans. Easy deployments? Over 100 one click installs for common services. Well then, what are we all standing around here for? Well, I did say this meeting probably could have been an email. Vulture is the everywhere cloud with 32 locations worldwide, allowing you to host apps and services no matter where you or your customers live. And with more than 100 one-click installers, you'll be able to get your OS and services up and running in no time. From managed WordPress solutions to gaming hosts and even full NVIDIA GPU stacks for AI-driven businesses, all without the cost or complexity of hyperscalers. Visit vulture.com craft and get a $300 credit to your account just for signing up. Again, that's vulture.com slash craft, and a huge thanks to Vulture for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. I spent last Tuesday on Intel's campus in Hillsboro, Oregon, getting up to speed on their upcoming 6900P series of CPUs. That is, Intel's all-new Granite Rapids Xeon CPUs designed specifically for HPC. As a quick disclaimer, I was invited by Intel to their Enterprise Tech Tour, and they did comp my hotel room during the event. Though I am under no obligation to even make content from that event, nor does Intel have any input over the production of this video. If they did, it would be full of AI talking points, as that was 90% of their presentation. I'm much more interested, though, in other aspects of the CPU launch, mainly around virtualization and hosting environments, and that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. Back in June of this year, Intel began shipping their Sierra Forest 67E series of Xeon CPUs, built around a metric ton of low power efficiency cores. And while 144 cores is exciting, and I can certainly think of multiple use cases for such a multi-threaded behemoth, I think we can all agree that it's the launch of Intel's high performance chips that most of us were waiting for. Both Intel's Sierra Forest efficiency core-based CPUs, as well as the Granite Rapids performance chips that we're taking a look at today, are based around Intel's in-house 5 nanometer lithography called the Intel 3 process, and is their second generation node built using ultraviolet lithography, with the first generation being Intel 4, based on 7 nanometer FinFET. Both Sierra Forest and Granite Rapids are part of Intel's Xeon 6 lineup, part of an increasingly segmented server market that also includes AMD's Genoa, Bergamo, and Sienna products. Today, we'll be talking specifically about Granite Rapids from the Xeon 6900P series, which is what launched earlier this week. Just like AMD's lineup, Intel is going with two different sockets and two very different levels of performance. On the previously released Xeon 6700E series, that is based around the LGA 4710 CPU socket. It has a maximum of 8 channels of DDR5-6400 memory support, along with 88 PCIe Gen 5 lanes for I.O. devices. The 6700E series uses exclusively efficiency cores, which means lower clock speeds, lower overall power draw, and most importantly, no hyper-threading. While Sierra Forest does manage to top out at 144 cores, that's also where the number of threads tops out as well. Looking at the all-new Xeon 6900P series, Granite Rapids is using an all-new socket in the LGA 7529. Even compared to Intel's fifth-generation Emerald Rapids and the LGA 4677, this socket is absolutely massive, and for pretty good reason. While Emerald Rapids had 64 cores and 8 channels of DDR5-4800, and it was decent for his time, Granite Rapids is coming in hard with Xeon 6P, featuring a full 128 CPU cores, 256 threads, and 12 channels of DDR5 support. Now, Intel isn't going to like hearing this out loud, but this is the first time that they've had core and memory channel parity with AMD since 2018, before AMD launched their Epic Roam platform. But I mean that with all of the positivity in the world. It is good to see Intel taking a very solid step forward. It's kind of hard to get excited about platforms like Sapphire or Emerald Rapids at 56 and 64 cores when AMD's had that available since 2019. 
and AMD has been marching out with 96 and 128 core parts for the better part of two years now. For those curious about how Intel pulled off such a high core count, of course, it's tiles all the way down. I guess Intel finally found the right glue to use. With Granite Rapids, we finally get the full tile implementation that Intel has been hinting at for the last couple generations. Sure, we got glimpses of it with split dies from Sapphire and Emerald Rapids, but most of their SKUs were actually monolithic dies, not split or tile assemblies. But with Xeon 6 and Granite Rapids, every SKU gets tiles. And as you find out, that's going to be both a good and a bad thing depending on your specific needs. Each chip in the 6900P lineup utilizes a pair of I.O. dies, which handle the I.O. fabric, PCIe, and UPI connections, and so on. As such, each 6900P processor will have the same PCIe lane count and UPI capabilities. There's also the compute dies, which obviously contain Intel's latest performance cores, along with four channels worth of DDR5 memory controllers. And here is where things get a bit complicated and a bit weird. Now, all of the SKUs launching this week have the same two I.O. die and three compute die layout, with models ranging from 72 to 128 cores. And we'll start with those numbers, as the 72 core part makes a lot of sense, with each compute die housing 24 cores and 48 threads. Computers often like to have even distributions, after all. But the 128 core part is an interesting beast. I don't know if there's any math aficionados in the audience, but 128 doesn't exactly divide evenly by 3, unless Intel designed each tile with 42 and 2 thirds CPU cores. In reality, the compute dies have non-matching core counts, with a pair of 43 core dies and a third rounding us out at 42 cores, for a total of 128 cores and 256 threads. A bit of an odd path, but we got there in the end. Each compute tile also contains a dedicated memory controller with four channels per tile. The top end SKUs that launched this week are all using three compute tiles, and we get a total of 12 channels of DDR5 support per CPU. That makes perfect sense. But that also means that future SKUs that launch with either one or two compute tiles on board are only going to have four or eight memory channels available to work with instead of the full 12. And I'll let you know why that's important in just a little bit. On the subject of memory, the 6900P series has a bit more give and take in store. Again, we've got up to 12 channels of DDR5-6400 registered ECC supported, but Intel has also introduced support for MR DIMMs, which clock up to a mind-melting 8800 megatransfers per second, making 6900P series one of, if not the fastest platforms for memory bandwidth that's available today. But like I said, there is a catch. While memory bandwidth has received a massive shot in the arm compared to previous generations, overall memory capacity is actually a bit of a regression. Looking again at the previous generation in Emerald Rapids, top-end SKUs could support 4 terabytes of memory, though again that was with only 8 channels of DDR5-4800. Granite Rapids 6900P lineup with 3 compute dies support a max of just 3 terabytes each. Part of the design consideration for Granite Rapids memory controllers meant doing away with support for dual rank in standard DDR5. That is, using multiple sticks of memory per available memory channel. That means on this platform, you get one memory DIMM per available channel, be it 4, 8, or 12, depending on the CPU tile count of your particular chip. So that means the CPUs that launched this week with the three compute tile design support a max of 12 channels and up to a full three terabytes of memory on a single CPU. But if you extrapolate that down, that means if you have a single compute tile unit, that's gonna support only four sticks of memory and a maximum of just one terabyte of RAM. Not exactly setting the world on fire when it comes to capacity. But not all may be lost, as Intel does offer support for CXL memory expansion on both Granite Rapids and Sierra 4 CPUs. CXL, or Compute Express Link, get it, there's an X there, offers expansion through specialized modules, often containing DDR4 DRAM. While CXL memory is significantly slower than DDR5-6400, and especially slower than DDR5-8800, Intel did show off a 2 to 1 setup with OLAP Flat 2 LM, where it was only about a 3% performance hit using CXL modules. Obviously, your results are going to vary pretty dramatically depending on your use case and workloads, but for those looking for high-capacity solutions, it's not like you're entirely left out in the cold. 
Memory controller layout is another area that may take some getting used to and may not be fully optimized in software out of the gate. Because each compute tile has its own memory controller directly attached, each tile is now its own independent NUMA node. Now this isn't exactly a new concept in HPC products, especially with dual socket systems, with AMD and Intel both having split NUMA nodes on multi-socket CPUs for the better part of two decades, and AMD actually utilizing multiple NUMA nodes in most of their epic generations. Xeon 6900P chips have two different NUMA mode settings that you can configure in the BIOS. First, there's the default SNC3 mode, which if you're at all familiar with Intel's NUMA specific configurations, you should be right at home here. SNC3, or sub-NUMA clustering, essentially treats each CPU tile as having their own pool of memory consisting of four attached memory channels. This is especially useful for applications that are sensitive to memory latency. There's also hex mode, where all of your system memory is placed into a large single pool. Each CPU tile has access to the entire pool of memory, though that will come at the cost of some increased latency. Hex mode essentially replaces what was known as SNC1 mode, because Intel still doesn't know how to keep the same name for a feature across more than two generations of products. Now, Intel is certainly not the first company to drop 128 cores onto a single CPU, allowing for up to 512 threads per two socket system. But they are the first to bring their highest performance CPU package to the equation. AMD's Bergamo CPUs do offer 128 cores and 256 threads, but those are based off AMD's Zen 4 C chips, a slightly cut down package built for higher efficiency applications. The Xeon 6980P 128 core chip manages a max turbo speed of 3.9 gigahertz for burst performance, an all core turbo speed of 3.2 gigahertz, along with 504 megabytes of L3 cache. Bergamo's top-end SKUs, by comparison, is the 9754S, and it tops out at just 3.1 GHz clock speeds, with all-core CPU speeds reaching somewhere around 2.7. Also, it has about half as much L3 cache as Intel's Granite Rapids. Now, likewise, AMD does offer a higher performance package with full Zen 4 chiplets on their Genoa platform. Their top-end chip is the 9684X, and while it does feature faster all-core performance of 3.42 GHz, that's across just 96 cores. And yes, it feels really weird to say only 96 cores. But there's still a few areas where Intel does fall short. While Bergamo CPUs have significantly cut down L3 cache, topping out at 256 megabytes for a 128 core chip, Xeon 6 still falls well short of Genoa's high watermark of 1152 megabytes on their 96 core parts. On that subject, storage and expandability is another your use case may vary situation. Both Genoa and Bergamo offer 128 lanes of PCI Express 5.0 connectivity, allowing for basically as many network, storage, AI accelerators, and GPUs as you can cram into a server box. Xeon 6 is still coming up a bit short by comparison though, with just 88 lanes on the 6700E series of chips and 96 lanes on the new 6900P series of chips. While that is still a ton of available connectivity and still an exponential increase from even two generations ago, it's still something that may sway potential customers over to Team Red if high density flash storage or AI accelerators are on the menu. And before we close out, there is one more stat that Intel threw at us that I think could be huge when it comes to cloud hosting providers. And it's something I really liked seeing addressed in this announcement. Servers deployed in service hosting environments rarely, if ever, stay pinned at Redline. Virtualization hosts obviously want to get as much performance as possible out of their hosting environments, but customer load is never a static figure. According to Intel, and based off anecdotal evidence that I have from deploying hosted servers over more than a decade in the industry, hosting servers spend most of their time sitting between 30 and 60% utilization. While Emerald Rapids had some specific tuning modes for this scenario, Granite Rapids by default is tuned to offer a higher performance efficiency in that utilization range. Now the slide doesn't show much detail, but Intel is claiming a 1.9x increase in performance per watt in a moderate workload use case. And I obviously haven't tested this myself yet, but it is good to see Intel taking some time to focus on real world use cases, not just insisting that everyone uses their new CPUs for AI and AI alone. My review system for Granite Rapids has not arrived yet, but it should be here in the next few weeks. While it's definitely going to be fun to drag race this system, or maybe even run Crisis in CPU rendering mode, what kind of tests are important to you or your organizations? 
I'm working on expanding my testing methodology and would love to hear what's important to those of you who actually watch this channel, because there's no sense in testing out servers if those results aren't going to apply to the people actually watching my content. With all of that out of the way, hopefully you got a good idea of what's coming out of Intel with the newest Xeon in the 6900P lineup and where it might fit into the market as a whole. Obviously, all opinions today are based with no hands-on testing data as I don't have my test system yet, and AMD's current lineup of Genoa and Bergamo CPUs might be wiped clean in a couple of weeks with Epic Turin being right around the corner. All of this may change pretty quickly, but stay tuned to the channel for the latest updates as I can give them to you. As always, if you like the content you see on this channel, head on over to craftcomputing.store where you can get some of my made and designed in-house merch and uh, start drinking like a pro and help keep the lights on around here. But that's gonna do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. for today is from Black Raven Brewing Company out of Woodenville, Washington. It is the Palette Trick IPA, brewed in collaboration with Barley Brown's Beer, clocking in at, I'm sure there's alcohol in here, 6.5%. Boy, that is clear. Look at that. Wow. It's been a while since I've gotten an IPA that clear. Also, that looks fantastic in that glass. Not that I'm biased. Oh, hot damn, hot damn. Sometimes you're craving a specific beer and it just hits right. Ah, uh, I don't know that this is the best IPA that I've ever had, but it's the best IPA I'm drinking right now. Whew. The 67... Ah, <coughs> <coughs> I need a beer. This is a really good beer. I I really like this one. Uh, pallet Trick IPA. Uh, looks like he's riding a pallet jack, which uh, totally against OSHA regulations and something I've never done and would never recommend doing to any uh, warehouse worker. It's a little bit clingy. What I mean by that, it's a little bit oily. It's, it's This one has a real hop resin uh, stick to it that a lot of people, if you dislike IPAs, that's one of the primary reasons you dislike IPAs is you take a drink of an IPA and even if you're eating like greasy pizza or burger or fries or mozzarella sticks, you still taste IPA. And it's because that oil, the, those lupulins just kind of cling to your tongue and don't let go. I don't mind that in the slightest. This one feels really well balanced. It's, it's not overly carbonated. It's not overly bitter. It's not overly flowery or dank. It's not overly citrusy or fruity. It's a little bit, if it leans one direction, it's a little bit vegetal. It, it's a little bit wet grass and celery. But overall, it's super pleasant to drink. It's a little bit chewy, which I kind of like in an IPA. And I feel like I want a really good burger to go with it right now. That would absolutely make this beer.